Hello, this is Mike Swanson of Wall Street. Wood. I got a very special guest with me today. I'm speaking with uh, David Skarika, who runs the website addictedtoprofits.com. We haven't actually done an interview for several months, so people. I actually got a couple emails uh, a couple weeks ago when those hurricanes are hitting the Caribbean because you live in the Bahamas, and people are worried that you might have been wiped out or something. <laughs> yeah, well, don't worry. It wasn't actually the, the funny thing is just because the Caribbean, you know, isn't that big of a place, right? And um, it, and people don't really have the ge geography like n knowledge of what it looks like, but you know, because the islands themselves are so small. But actually, like 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 for example, one of the ar ar islands that got wiped out was uh, Dominica, right? And Dominica is basically like from the Bahamas is a thousand miles away. And I guess that's kind of like, I don't know, North Carolina to New York. I don't know how exactly th that is, but it, like, it's like if, if a hurricane hit North Carolina, you know, everyone in New York would be fine. So it was just like, you know, it, you, you really have to be within a hundred, 200 mile radius of these things to have any effects. And you almost have to be within a 50 to 70 mile radius to have the hurricane type effects. And you have to be within a 20 mile radius to get the worst of it. So unless you're like, say, Puerto Rico was, and the eye comes right over you, um, you you're basically not much is um, is really, really going to uh, probably happen to you, right? So yeah, yeah, basically, yeah, nothing much happened. We actually, the funny thing was there was a, a, a later hurricane called Nate, which hit uh, kind of Mississippi and Louisiana and then came up through the Northeast. And I'm here in Canada right now, so the background's a little different. I'm staying with my father for a little bit. Um, and there was a lot, there was some wind and rain here from this Nate. And I was laughing saying that, you know what, I probably got more of the effects of one of these hurricanes in Canada after the thing was kind of just finishing off going through than I got, you know, down in the Bahamas. Well, I, I'm not, it's been a while since we've done one of these interviews. I mean, I know you travel a lot in September and in October and in July, I was starting to get a little bit worried about the stock market and actually, uh, I had some short positions. And I saw some internal weakness in the market, but then by Labor Day, I got out of those positions I had because uh, the internal stuff was firming up. It didn't really look like, uh, therefore, we were going to get a big stock market meltdown or anything like that. And, and of course, we're now going higher. And I've been doing some different kind of trading, you know, selling options occasionally uh, to make some income while holding uh, other stuff that I got long-term investments in. So, you know, what a lot of people are wondering is, you know, what is the way now to make money in the market? There's not any volatility. And so, so how you've been adapting to these market conditions? Look, I had options as a kind of hedges. Like, um, both of us came to the conclusion, like I've already sold some of my short funds, that both of us came to this conclusion that really with the with the market that when it was it wasn't falling by say late september early october that it wasn't going to fall at a, 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 in a great deal at all so what i've been doing is and, and i did the shift i've been planning the shift by the way since the summer it wasn't just because the market didn't fall this fall this was something i was planning since the summer you and i both do a lot of private placements a lot of pre-ipo c type companies mostly in mining but also in other sectors and I, I'd had a couple of these do kind of well in the last year. I basically, the last year I used is kind of this um, th this testing of this kind of strategy. And um, I had a little technology deal. Uh, it came out and did well. And then I also had a, a, a mining deal that I invested in on the pre-IPO. Uh, it's kind of seed financing that did well. So then um, I, got, I had two more coming out um, this fall. One just came out. It was okay. You know, it, it didn't do as well as what these usually do, but I got another one coming out in a month or so, which should do well. And now uh, when my idea was, okay, when all of these are now trading that I've done, I did four of them in the last year, basically three mining deals and a tech deal. I was like, okay, well, you know, um, I'm going to take a little bit of profits and then put it into other deals, uh, you know, pre-IPOs or seeds. And I have another two or three. So basically what I'm doing right now is very simple. is that I'm doing these kind of early stage financings, you know, pre-IPO, for the private companies, and then I'm just taking take five to ten percent of that investment, or what that investment would be. So, say you're doing ten grand, you take five hundred to a thousand dollars, and I'm putting it in a, a put options on whatever select companies I think are overvalued. 
just to hedge that investment because either if the market falls, my IPO doesn't come out, or if it falls and say my, the stock of my IPO goes down, I'm hedged with this put position. So that's that's essentially what I'm doing right now because to be honest, I, I, I or to be blunt more um, than anything, you know, last two to three years, I had been looking for a major decline in the markets. It hasn't happened. And that just kind of wears on you. And I think you can agree with me here. You just give up at some point of trying to time it exactly because no one can. So this is my strategy just to be long some beaten up sectors via these, these pre IPOs. So obviously mining would be one of those because mining is one of the sectors that hasn't you know, really boomed with the stock market. And then um, um, it, it's to be long those things and just hedge it with puts. And the thing is, if you do get a crash type scenario, those puts are going to go up so much you're not going to care about the IPOs. And if the market keeps going strong, you're going to make enough money in those um, uh, IPOs. You really won't care about. Um, uh, you can see my dad's in the background. Uh, you, you, you don't. You don't, You really won't care about the um, the, uh, the, the the put options spiraling are worthless. And I'm also going to do some other in the trading side. We're also going to do more straddles. I actually. The three straddles I put on here, and let me get the chart here just so you can see here. Um, we'll, we'll be able to see here. Um, okay, so this was, a, I don't mind doing this because these, these companies have already, these trades have already done. I put one, this is a Chinese internet company called Vips, Vip Shops. They, they, they sell clothes online. So just a few months ago, we put a straddle on with calls being, I think, um, I think what the talk was about 12. And I put the calls at 13 and the puts at 11. And I just, I we're just about to sell the puts here in the uh, newsletter. And I think the puts about tripled in price. So that means even if the calls expire worthless, you do the math. If you triple and something goes zero in the other, you know, we're going to make 50% on that trade. So another one is when, at the beginning of the year, when was in this long term trading range you can see here in 2016, you know, between about 80 and 100, roughly 80, 105. And, and then you can see here that it's – so at the beginning of the year, I was like, you know what, this is kind of a huge move. It's either fall back to its lows or even break to new lows, you know, to 50 or below, or this is going to break out and go to 130, 140, 150. Well, you know, the, the breakout happened, and the calls we had in this did really well. And then this another one that was similar to that was you – know, this is a, another Chinese online company. They do car sales, and you can see same thing. You got this big trading range going on bid up between about the late teens – in the mid to late twenties. So I put a, a straddle on this when the stock was about 20 thinking, okay, the stock's going to go to 30 or 40 or it's going to break down and go to 10 and it, it's gone to 50. Now I didn't ride the calls all the way up. We, we sold the calls when the stock was in the thirties and forties, but that just shows you, and you know, we sold it in the newsletter that just shows you, you know, the kind of strategy. And again, it goes back to what I just said with the IPOs. If the calls go up, like a you know, stock like this going up a hundred, 200%, you really don't care that the puts expire worthless because you make so much in the calls. And if you were to get a crash in the market and one of these stocks goes down 80 or 90% or something, you're not going to really care about the, the straddle, the call, because the puts with that, especially when the premium spikes, it, you're going to make so much money, you're, you're going to do really well. And personally, what I'm trying to do, because I am doing the IPOs on the long side as well, I'm really hedging, say, if I do a straddle, it won't be a pure straddle with an equal position. It's going to be edged more to the put side because my idea is, again, it's more the hedge side. And, and the kind of the idea is this. Okay, look, it, if um, these calls go up and the IPOs go up, you're going to make a lot of money alongside. Anyhow, so all I'm really trying to do with the calls and the straddles, basically make back the money I would have lost in the puts. Uh, you know, you know, so I, I probably I, are more leveraged going to be like two to one on the put to call side. But, again, you get a huge move like this. Like the calls I bought, I think I bought 25 or 30 calls on this at the beginning of the year when the stock was 20. If this stock is 50. These calls would be up an absolutely huge amount. I find them here. Because I remember they were January 25, I think. And I think they were like $2 when I bought them. Because, you know, there's some premium. Um, I don't know which is that. You, you got to love the new Yahoo Finance. Totally useless. Um, One second, let me go look at this here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can see, look, let me just find this here, the options. Yeah, I remember they were about $2 when we did it in the newsletter. And they were January because I was just doing it for a 
a move happening this year. And you can see the calls, the 25s are now $26. So you would have made about 13 to one. And even with the puts going worthless, that's six or seven to one. And I think anyone would be happy making six or seven to one on a trade, right? And even if you were more hedged to the put side, you still would have made three or four to one, right? And by the way, the ones I'm going to hedge more to the put, this was a straddle actually equally because the stock was so beaten up. This at one point was like a $100 company and it was down to 20. But the ones I would do probably more leverage to the put side would be like these kind of parabolic blow off stocks like NVIDIA or, or uh, Netflix, something like that. I would probably be more leverage to the put side because obviously right now I think that the the, the upside in a stock like, like that is for those is kind of limited. Well, we're interesting uh, stock market environment where on um, any given day, the market itself seems to barely be moving. So, for example, today the S and P five hundred isn't even up two points, and this has been more and more the case. I mean, <laughs> in many days, it's not even a single point up or down. You know, it's not moving, and. Um, so I think that's making it very difficult for a lot of people to do much, especially in the exchange traded funds. So for action, many people are gravitating to trading Bitcoin or just a few select uh, stocks. So this afternoon, I ha actually haven't been watching CNBC for, for like months and because uh, nothing's going on, right? But this morning I did turn it on and uh, they had several people talk about NVIDIA, Micron. It's just the same stocks that they would be talking about 90 days ago. And it just seems to me that's all that's going on. A few people, there's just a few stocks people are even interested anymore because it's hard for them to find things that move. So I think like options trading makes a lot of sense in this well, market where everything is just so dead. And I think the thing is, too, I'm showing the video right now. And like, if you get this on a log scale, you know, the problem is it's so difficult to know these things. But when, when you look at the video, the thing is, we all know how this is going to end, but we just don't know when it's going to end, right? Like, I thought NVIDIA had done that at the beginning of the year, and now it's up another 100%, which is, by the way, the great thing about doing a straddle trade. Is that then it doesn't you don't have to be right in what you think right so that's that's kind of one another advantage like for example I got another st a stock which is a beverage company I'm not gonna name it here because that's just for my paying subscribers right now but this is a stock that kind of looked like Nvidia and had this straight up parabolic move and it's actually starting to crash and fall apart now so th that's you know what you're looking at another thing too Mike is that you talked about the volatility so this you can say, well, why don't I could just do the straddles on NVIDIA and Netflix? First of all, those bigger companies have bigger premiums in the puts. So that's why I like to find these kind of smaller companies that maybe don't have all the option interest and just still enough liquidity to trade the options, but they're not going to have those premiums because not everyone is in them. And then secondly, like, for example, I was just mentioning uh, the case of, uh, I'll show you a longer term chart of Vida right now. This is why I picked. So you can see that this stock had this huge run up in 2013 14, crashed, and then had this nice base building. So I was buying this beaten up company I knew that could maybe have this run and it could double, triple, quadruple, or something from the bottom. Like, let's face it, right now, even if you, even though they had good years this year, even at the beginning of the year, NVIDIA and Netflix weren't going to triple or quadruple from their current levels. So I'm also looking for companies that are kind of basing or coiling that can have these big moves, you know, to the upside or downside. So that's another advantage of say, you know, like, like what, what I'm trying to do for you is like, or do for people is it's not just like buying all these mainstream stocks. It's looking for companies that are kind of like basing or could have much, much bigger moves that are under people's radars. Like, no one is ever going to really think of you know, this, this, this kind of like a bit of, bit of thing. And the reason I picked this thing is you can see this thing back in 2012 was a three, four dollar stock. Well, that's what I was thinking. I'm thinking like, well, if this bubble keeps bursting in this particular stock. It could go to three, four dollars or it could have this base here at around 20 and go up to 50, 60 dollars or 40, 50 dollars. And that's the, you know, the latter happened. 
But that's what I'm saying. That's the kind of big move. Either way, you're getting 100% move on the upside or a 50, 60, 70% move on the downside. That's kind of what you want to me in, in, in one of these strata plays. And you probably you're gonna what you're gonna have to do is try to find these kind of lesser known companies. Like I'll give you one right now that I'm looking to do a call trade on. This is a gold company. This is something we both know very well called El Dorado. And they have been having some problems with this mine in Greece, which has helped depress the stock. And you can see the bear market in El Dorado, but you can also see that El Dorado in about the last year or two has been basing from about two dollars to four dollars. So again, if there's a big move higher in gold, Eldorado has now solved the problems, by the way, with this mining grease. This is a stock that can go six, seven, eight dollars, and a call trade on this, you know, uh, expiring, say, in January 2019, can make a lot of money. So that's kind of the thing. I haven't even done this, by the way, personally yet. Um, I put it in the newsletter, and I'm gonna add to, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy a position for myself in it in the fourth quarter here. But this is the kind of thing I'm looking for. So I'm not looking for just chasing one of the high flyers, but I'm looking for something now that has kind of been basing and could um, uh, continue to move higher uh, and, and significantly higher if it if it does finally break out. Yeah, that El Dorado. I actually own the stock. Uh, just saying that for disclosure purposes, I own a position in it. It's not a massive position or something, but I do own it. Yeah. So anyhow, that's really simple what I'm doing. So I'm doing deals yeah. with puts as hedges, and then in the option side, we're going to do mostly straddle type trades. Um, looking for again, like I'll, I'll probably do some of the big cap tech stocks, which are now looking frothy. But I'm really going to look for more uh, trades, like I showed you with Win or or with uh, Bitta. I'm going to be looking at companies that I think um, are, are kind of having bases or beaten up. And can have big moves in either direction. Look, I'll, I'll give you one right now. I'll give one away right now. now. I do not have a position in this. We have a recommended position, but this is one that's on my radar. And it's 3D Systems. This is a, you can see it just broke down here. So 3D printers had a bubble a few years ago, okay? You're similar. You're going to see actually, it almost just, when I put it on a linear scale, you're going to see it almost looks like that bit of stock, right? Yeah, that blow up. And you see it went all the way down from 97 to 6, and you've got this base now. So either I think this bubble continues to burst and this is a three dollar stock, or you 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 kind of have this you know two year base between six and say twenty and you break out of that and this stock goes to thirty forty fifty dollars a share. So again, that's a great company to do one of these um, one of these uh, 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 straddle trades because it's either going to go down seventy percent or up to three four hundred percent. You know. Yeah, and I think it's important to emphasize that, like I was saying earlier, the S&P 500 isn't even up uh, two points today. And we've seen day after day where it's not even up or down a single point. But there's action going on. You know, there are stocks making big moves. Even to the downside, there's some stocks that, are, that have bad news and they'll just dump um, uh, what was one that, that fell, a pizza. Uh, Papa John's had a smash earlier this week on earnings uh you know there are many stocks no, that, that was sorry that was that was dominoes oh, Dom 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 yeah and uh you know uh netflix was just down a little bit today but you know, there are things going on it's just you trading the etfs i mean uh it, you know and i do own some etfs uh, but it's just you know there's trading vehicles they're very difficult right now because of the market conditions there's just no Way other way to put it. Well, in another advantage in the strategy that I'm doing, like if you just use Domino as an example, like look at this stock, and this is a, excuse my language, this is a fucking pizza company, right? <laughs> you know, this is not a, this is not a, a tech company or some high growth industry, and this stock has gone from almost two dollars in the financial crisis to over two hundred dollars. It's up a hundred times. So we all know that is not sustainable, and. And so the thing is, well, if you did a straddle type trade on this, you're probably you're either going to continue this parabolic moves because no parabolic moves go parabolic and go sideways. They all keep going parabolic or they collapse, right? So this could blow off to three hundred, or it's going to completely crash to forty dollars in the next couple of years. So that that or it could go to three hundred, then crash to forty, right? So that's a perfect kind of company. What what you'd want, in my opinion, 
hooked you on some of these um, 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 uh, straddle style trades. And obviously with something like this, with the huge move it's had, you would have to have this trade more biased to, uh, I think, the put side because of how A, overvalued the company is, and B, how ridiculously overbought and, and uh, uh, parabolic the chart is. Well, what what's your take uh, or feeling now uh, about gold and mining stocks? Because last year there was a tremendous rally in uh, the GDX gold stock ETF. It was up 50% for the year. This year we've seen some rallies up. Many predictions for gold crashes uh, that haven't materialized. Uh, I think Larry Edelson was calling for a total uh, collapse in gold and, and um, Harvey Dent too. But those ha things haven't happened. But then on the other side of things, gold is still around $1,300 an ounce. It went above it a couple of days ago, then back below it. And, and uh, so, the, you know, it's not soaring either. So what's your feeling on it? Is it about well, my feeling is I can't get the GDX going back that long because it's only been trading yeah. for over 10 years or something. Um, yeah, 2006. So it's been trading for about 11 years. But what I can do is show you the HUI. And having me and you met in the early 2000s when that gold bull market was just starting. And if you go look, look at that kind of consolidation that happened here in 2002 or even here in 2001, um, actually, this is one where I'll go back to the log scale because we can see those consolidations better on the log scale. Yeah, you can see this consolidation here or here or here, uh, you know, in 2004, 2005. I just think that we're now seeing one of these consolidations where you've got the big spike or the, the move higher, which lasted about six months. And then you get this consolidation that can last a year, you know, nine months, 12 months, even up to 18 months. And then you're getting to get ready for the next move higher. I think that's kind of what the gold stocks are seeing. And seasonally, they tend to start to move higher in November, December. So we're only a, a month or two away from that. And that's what I think probably could happen here going forward. That we're in this consolidation and then we could, could see this another move, this next move higher. You know, similar to what you can see happen in, say, 2002 when the HUI went from about 60 to 150 or in 2002, 2003, when after that consolidation, it went from about 100 to 250, or you see 2004 to 2006, um, 2005, 2006, sorry, when it went from about 160 to 400. So and notice that every time those consolidations and the move higher tends to be about 150%. So you do the math on that, it means we could go to maybe 500 or 600, you know, almost back to the highs which would make sense because I would think that after this huge base in gold too, we're going to see another huge move maybe back to, you know, that 16 to 1800 level, um, you know, which was essentially, I think 1900 was the high back in 2011. So it makes sense. And the gold stock was interesting about them is, you know, we, we, I talked about straddles and we talked about shorts. A lot of the companies that you, me and you have tried to short are because They've done buybacks and they, they, they've loaded up their balance sheets with debt. debt. Actually, you men mentioned Papa John's. That's one stock that I have as a short or a put option play due to mostly its balance sheet. And I think what's going to help that, uh, by the way, work out, and Papa John's is acting very weakly, is actually that is the big pizza company for the NFL. And, you know, this with a lot of hands being turned off by these protests and the whatnot, I think that is really going to hurt their um uh their, their top and bottom line and this is at a time when they've already had zero growth um as well but what's interesting is a stock like papa john's has been piling up the debt to buy back shares to inflate earnings or a stock like eric um a lot of these stocks they're actually having earnings you know why because they've cut costs and they've paid off debt and that debt payoff leads to less interest expenditures and you know helps the bottom line and, and, and that's what's interesting is that while the rest of the market has all got more leveraged and companies more leveraged, the gold companies are actually less leveraged, you know? Yeah, they're in the opposite situation they were in three years ago, that's for sure. Yeah. And you can see in the case of Barrick, it's back to where it was, say, you know, at that when I went to 23, it's back to where it was in, say, early 2013. And that's when gold was 13, 1400 an ounce. So it's going back to where it was essentially – when gold is 13, 14, or 1400 an ounce with the stock with gold now below 1300. And that just, I think that just shows you 
you know, like like kind of that the, the, the that it's kind of outperforming gold here um, over the last year since the bottom of the market gold market in early 2016, and partly because of the restructuring and the pay down of debt, etc. Well, I don't want to keep you too long, so I'll make sure I ask you if if people want to sign up, you know, get your trading ideas and, and your straddle trades and, and so forth, uh, where should they go to do that? Well, go to addictedtoprofits.net, sign up for my free letter. Oh, there's two things, is that I just switched my billing system over and we're going to start doing monthly billing. Uh, you and I do promotions from time to time as well, but I am going to give you one more final offer. Uh, if you want access to some of these deals that I've, I've talked about, um, I'm going to actually put two on the website by the end of this month. And um, I'm going to offer two things. Number one, the old subscription price of $700 for a year. Um, uh, you, all you got to do is write me an email at addicted to profits at hotmail.com. Um, if we could put that on the email or something, and I'll offer you that price. You can probably PayPal me the money. But I'm also off offering a discount on the premium life lifetime um a service i usually charge 2500 for that i'm offer, offering a discount of 1500 and you can basically paypal or wire me the money i prefer wire but you can one of those two and then you'll get access to all these deals that we're going to do uh etc etc and you know of course if you know the regular subscription is 80 90 dollars a month paying 1500 for lifetime is essentially <laughs> not much more than pay you know than a 14 or 15 month subscription so that's kind of worth doing so you know, if, if you email me I will um, give you the details on how to do that lifetime I'm only going to keep that open this month October because then we're going to start the new monthly uh, type of subscriptions okay well uh, I plan on um, buying some of these deals myself probably every single one that you're mentioning, we've done several of them in the past. Uh, really, a year ago is when we were when when we were really doing a lot of them, and I think it might be uh, you know these are stocks that trade in Canada, and they're basically uh, tend to, they're like pre IPO deals. You're buying a financing. The stock isn't trading yet, then it's going to go out and, and go public, and you're just wanted, just getting just, an insight. I just wanted to show one that we did. That's a good idea. It's called Canuck Resources. Um, we bought this at a 10 cent pre IPO financing. Both of us has not even mentioned it in our newsletters yet, but we, we did buy this uh, in this. And the stock, as you can see, is 38 and a half, 40 cents right now. It's traded roughly between you know, 35 to 50 cents. So, yeah, we made about four times on our money. We both bought the 10 cent C financing. We both have another one coming public probably by the end of November called Buena Vista. And then um, uh, we're, we're going to both be doing a few more of these, uh, you know, between now and the end of the year as well. Yeah. I just think it's important for people to understand what we're talking about because it's not something <laughs> they're going to hear on TV <laughs> for sure. You know, how to do something like that. And uh, maybe they should, you know, it, it's just, I mean, the opportunities in them are, are enormous. And yeah, and I think you have to, but you have to realize it's not like we bought that CDA, that Canuck, and the next day it started trading. These things usually take three, six, maybe even twelve months before they begin to tr trade afterwards. So people, I think, have to kind of understand that that this is kind of a process. But actually, the one advantage you got is two of them that we have. The ones I'm talking about over the next month that we'll be doing. They will both probably be trading between December and the end of February. So that's also an advantage right now is, like I said, usually you got to wait three, six, even 12 months for these things to trade. And the two that we have coming up right now um, will actually, you won't, you know, will be trading probably within two to four months, which is kind of rare to be able to get in one of these and then see it trade that quickly. Yeah. So it's in, in uh, with the stock market the way it is, I mean, it seems like a good, time to, to be doing this and also one of them is a gold stock that that we're looking at and uh you know we're, we're both very bullish on gold for next year too so yeah yeah, well, yeah we should notice that don't too one is kind of a copper gold deal and the other is uh, a marijuana deal yeah and, and I, by the way that's another way to do hedging uh, i guess the last thing is that 
you know, we're both bullish on gold and worried about the stock market, but I had this tech deal that did really well, like in one of these things. And um, it, it's just like, you might as well diversify in that too, if the market keeps going up. And, and this is a unique situation. This marijuana deal is in Canada and Canada is legalizing marijuana July 1st. So Canada Day of 2018. So all of these marijuana, or not all of these, but a lot of these marijuana companies are getting licenses to produce because they have to have the supply ready um, uh, uh, you know, for that July 1st date. So that, that's that's kind of an industry that's probably going to really boom here. I would expect that a lot of those stocks will trade up, up into that, that legalization date and then maybe sell the news once it's actually legalized and the sales have really you know, come. But, but definitely in the next three to six months, I would expect those to continue to do well. Well, there's... And, and you know, besides the Facebooks and the videos in this business, you know, the, the past two years, there's probably been no speculative sector of the United States stock market that's gone up more than various marijuana stocks. So yeah, well, and the nice thing, by the way, about the legalization in Canada, and again, if people um, it, um, send uh, you have to contact me about it, is that they are so regulated here. Like I went to the company's, uh, you know. Uh, uh, plant. It's an old craft plant in a place called Coburg, which is a small town north of Toronto, and craft foods. And so this plant has been shut down, and now they're turning it into this weed production plant. And you, the security that they had to have on file, they're restricted in the amount they can produce until they get more, you know, approvals. So in Canada, it's not just these crappy little panties, penny stocks that was some guy growing weed in his field somewhere. You know, like these things have to go through tons of regulations and government approvals. So that a lot of these are actually you know, are going to end up being really legitimate large companies. Yeah. You know? Well, thanks for taking the time to talk with me and everyone else. And we'll, you know, do, do the next uh, video uh, hopefully sooner than than we did this one. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. We won't do next time. We'll be back in the Bahamas. Yep. Right.